Welcome everyone to another Crisis Conversation live from the Better Life Lab. We're delighted to have you here with us today where we're talking about being pregnant, navigating pregnancy through uh, COVID-19, uh, but beyond that, really looking at uh, the health of pregnant mothers, pregnant workers, how they fare in the work workplace, and what we need to do to ensure their health and safety, as well as their ability to continue working if that's what they need and choose to do, uh, not only during the crisis, but beyond. Uh, so today we've got a, a, just a, a wealth of wonderful people who can share stories and also share their expertise. We've got Kushbu Shah. She's the interim director and, uh, dire excuse me, interim editor in chief of the Fuller Project, which is a global nonprofit newsroom dedicated to objective, groundbreaking reporting on women. And everyone should subscribe to their newsletter. It's amazing. Rebecca Pontikas, uh, she's the principal of Pontikas Law LLC, who specializes in caregiver and pregnancy discrimination cases. We've got Dina Baxt, a co founder and co president of A Better Balance which seeks to ensure that no workers, including pregnant workers, have to choose between job, health, or family. We've got Gabrielle Caverell McNeil. She's the Director of Workforce Development for New Moms, an organization in Chicago that's dedicated to supporting new mothers in the core areas of life, home, jobs, and family. And we have Dr. Ashley Deutsch. She's the Director of Quality and Patient Safety for the Department of Emergency Medicine at Bay State Medical Center in Springfield, Massachusetts. And uh, she, we're going to start with you because uh, you're not only a, you know, a medical expert at this, at this time of a global pandemic, but you are one of the bright spots. We're going to be talking about pregnancy discrimination and you have a situation where you are also pregnant and you worked with your employer uh, to find a way to, to both ensure the, your health and safety, the health and safety of your child, but also continue working and supporting your family. So welcome all. And um, Ashley, Dr. Deutsch, let's start with you. And since we are in the middle of a pandemic, what can you tell us about um, what pregnant mothers, pregnant workers are really facing in, in this pandemic? For many months, the CDC was silent. We didn't really know. And then the new study came out that was really quite disturbing. Uh, can you tell us what we know and what we don't know about navigating uh, corona while pregnant? Sure, and thank you so much for having me. Um, it's a real honor to be part of this discussion. Um, what I will say is I would first of all encourage um, everyone who's pregnant or thinks they may be at a higher risk with coronavirus to go to the CDC's website, cdc.gov. There's um, some good updated information there. In terms of what we know about coronavirus and pregnancy, the answer is still not much. Mm -hmm. Our understanding is, is always changing. Um, but it's not really clear um, what the impacts are, especially at the very beginning. We weren't even really sure how it was transmitted. Yeah. Um, right. So it, it's uh, at this point, we think that there might be a higher risk of um, more severe illness for pregnant women. Um, we know that there have been some newborns who have tested positive for coronavirus shortly after birth, mm. but we do not know if they contracted the virus before, during, or after mm. birth. Wow. Um, we believe the best evidence shows that it is safe for breastfeeding mothers who, are, um, who test positive for coronavirus to continue breastfeeding their infants while wearing a mask and washing hands frequently and before all feeds. Um, and that the benefit likely outweighs the, the risk in that mm -hmm. case. But truly, it's sort of a brand new world for medicine and certainly for pregnant women. And so it's, it's hard for all of us um, to gauge what our, what our risk is with pregnancy and coronavirus. You know, so Ashley, we're going to get back to you about your, your own story in a minute. But what I'd like to do is open this up. You know, let's go to Kushbu Shah. So Kushbu, um, you have a number of reporters who have been uh, sort of scouring, scouring the earth, so to speak, for, for stories, uh, particularly how the pandemic is impacting women and their, their experience. And some of your reporters have, come, have really written some very powerful stories uh, about not only uh, pregnant workers, but also maternal health, and particularly looking at uh, racial equity. We already know that there's uh, in just alarmingly high um, racial inequities when it comes to maternal and child mortality. Can you tell us about some of the um, some of the some of the stories and the reporting that you all are doing at the Fuller Project? 
Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, Bridget. So as you mentioned, we are, that's what we have been looking at at the Fuller Project even before coronavirus, right? That intersection between um, the lack of access to, to solid maternal mortality, uh, maternal health care and that link to maternal mortality and how it is sometimes the worst in some communities um, for black and brown women. And so when we saw the coronavirus cases rising and impacting communities of color, predominantly black Americans all across the US, we knew that that was the first place to look, right? That's where we could really dig in um, and report on what we, were, we knew would be a double public health crisis for women of color right on our doorstep. Mm -hmm. um, and so we started off, right, as Dr. Deutsch mentioned, when we didn't know a whole lot about how it would impact pregnant women we spoke to a number of women around the country um, with our reporting, with our contributing reporter, Eileen Guo, who spoke to women who were about to give birth, about to go to hospitals, who saw one of whom was homeless, who couldn't find diapers, who was told that her community doula um, wouldn't be able to support her during labor, um, mm -hmm. someone she had practiced with um, for nearly nine months. And then um, when restrictions were tightest in California and no one could um, join her for her for her labor. And so she faced giving birth alone. And mm. I, and that's what happened to her. Wow. And so I, I just can't, yeah. I can't imagine how devastating that's got to be for anyone. Right. And she, and on top of that, she had nowhere to go afterwards um, with, with her newborn baby. And so she was facing the prospect of raising this child, you know, essentially in solitude and giving birth mm -hmm. um, by herself. And so um, as the weeks went by, we realized that there were different threads of this continuing conversation to look at and our reporter, Jessica Washington, found in Milwaukee, where a fifth of the city's coronavirus cases back then were among its black residents. Mm. Um, the city's health commissioner said she had heard anecdotally that there were upticks in miscarriages and stillbirths during the pandemic, predominantly among black and brown women. Mm. And so then Jessie reported on that next step, right, where she t spoke to a mother of two, um, an essential worker at a fast food restaurant who was making this impossible decision to leave her children in daycare where one of them had contracted coronavirus. Oh, wow. Um, but she was a fast food worker and her family um, relied on her money from her job at Wendy's. And so she had to make an impossible decision. Did she end up um, working and paying the bills or did she, um, but if she quit, how would she pay the bills? But then she would leave her child um, in the center of this public health crisis. Right, right. And as a, you know, as a fast food worker, um, she was also one of those who was carved out of emergency paid family leave legislation. She was carved out of emergency paid sick days legislation. So it sounds like she didn't really have many options. So at this point, let me turn to you, Dina. Um, so Dina, A Better Balance does such amazing work, um, <clears throat> really bringing pregnancy discrimination, sort of the experience of pregnant mothers uh, into the kind of the public conversation. Um, you, when I, when I first started learning about this several years ago, I had never even heard of pregnancy discrimination. It's not something that we talked about or paid attention to. It was a real invisible issue. And, and so tell us about you know, you know the some of the women that 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 um, Kushbu's reporters are writing about that that really f face kind of impossible choices when they're pregnant. What is pregnancy discrimination? What do pregnant workers really face in in the United States sure. before the pandemic, and what are they facing now? How's it making it different or worse? Sure. So. Um, unfortunately, pregnancy discrimination, you know, after decades after passage of the Federal Pregnancy Discrimination Act in 1978, um, is still alive and well in this country, and it takes many forms. Um, you know, many people may be more familiar with the type of discrimination saying that you can't take adverse action, you can't cut someone's hours or fire them just on the basis of the fact that they're pregnant. Mm -hmm. um, a, a form of discrimination that we see particularly with low wage workers, low income women, particularly um, women of color who call our helpline are women who are in low wage and physically demanding jobs and they need um, a modest temporary adjustment to their work hours or duty or schedules in order to maintain their health um, yeah. and continue earning a paycheck, right? So pre-pandemic we got, you know, this is, a huge issue, you know, women who has a temporary, uh, maybe a high risk pregnancy, doctor advises no heavy lifting, 
employer says no, go home. What that means is a profound, um, that has a profound impact on their econ long-term economic equality. Oftentimes they wind up homeless on food stamps. Mm. Um, and we have, you know, dozens and dozens of stories of, around this, which has led to um, passage of laws around the country to really say, no, we need to ensure that pregnant workers you know, have a clear rights to accommodation in these situations, just as workers' disabilities. Um, you know, and this is the type of bias, as I said, snowballs into lasting, you know, economic disadvantage and is one reason along with supports like paid family medical leave and scheduling and quality affordable childcare that motherhood and poverty, particularly for women of color, are so inextricably linked, right? It's, yeah. this is, you know, it's a driver of econ long-term economic inequality. So at the current moment, you know, we're, it's, um, we are hearing from pregnant workers, you know, who are scared to death, frankly, to return to work um, because especially those in essential jobs, but also those who are just required now to be back at work. Um, but they, in many instances, know that they're returning to an unsafe workplace, but they feel like they have no other choice um, to continue working. And so I just want to underscore one thing that the doctor, you know, said earlier, there is CDC guidance, but um, this is often um, an important um, conversation that you are going to have, a pregnant worker is going to have with her own medical provider. Yeah. It's an individualized assessment about a, what a pregnant worker's need, and it's not a one-size-fits-all. And we provide, um, you know, very detailed information on a Better Balances website about how to ask for accommodations, and there are clear protections for pregnant workers who are at higher risk, like that may trigger protections under the Americans with Disabilities Act. So if you have um, gestational diabetes or preeclampsia, you know, that may entitle you concretely to, you know, certain, you know, enforcing rights around distancing or PPE or transfers or, you know, or in certain instances, not for all essential workers, but some women may be able to telecommute. So yeah. there are rights that do exist. Um, and so it's important that pregnant women do know the rights that are in the books now to help them. And we have a lot of information on our website. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, some of the stories that you've brought up over the years, you know, you talk about some pregnant women who needed um, water or they've needed yeah. a stool to sit on yeah. instead of being, yeah. you know, standing all yeah. day as a cashier. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. I, I mean, I remember working on a, uh, on a story when I was at the Washington post about a police officer who just needed you know, a bulletproof vest that fit That's over right. her growing body and uh, yeah. not getting those kinds of accommodations. Like you say, really, you know, then women were made kind of put into this terrible situation where they had to choose between, you know, working in a place, you know, in a way that might uh, impact or harm their health and the health of their child versus being able to uh, continue working and uh, and support their family and you know have have financial security. You know, at this point, let me turn to you, Gabrielle and Rebecca. I know that we we want to get to like the legal challenges and legal cases um, as well. But it, you know, Gabrielle, with with the new moms, you work a lot with women who are pregnant, with, who are about to deliver new moms. You know, what are you seeing? You know, it, you know when it comes to um, getting accommodations so that they're enabled, you know, they're able to keep working or they're able to get a job or, you know, if that's what they, if, if that's what they're looking for. What are you seeing now, um, you know, with the pandemic? How is that impacting the, the mothers that you work with? Yeah, thank you. And I appreciate being a part of the conversation. Um, some of the things that we're seeing and hearing uh, mirror those that uh, Kushbu and Dina explained around women not knowing that they have access or not having access, uh, delivering on their own in the hospital uh, because the doula is no longer able to be with them at their bedside as they're giving birth. Um, and they give birth and then they're very fearful about going back to work, about having access to childcare, uh, in Chicago, there was a kind of mass push to get moms the resources that they need, particularly from um, our agency. So we were, you know, hand delivering things like diapers and formula because we weren't able to uh, go to their local stores and retrieve those items because they had either been uh, brought out or there was uh, some looting in the area. So um, lack of access has been an issue, but it's just an overwhelming feeling of fear um, and miseducation not knowing that they have these workplace rights. Uh, I literally have heard women say, well, I didn't know I could apply for work right now because I'm pregnant or wow. I had to wait until my child was at least six weeks before I could apply to start working. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's just, uh, just miseducation 
uh, and misinformation out here about what their rights are. And so a part of the work that we want to do is make sure that our women are armed with this with this information and that they know their rights and they know how to exert their rights. And when they are going back into the workplaces, there's also uh, a safety issue. We know that they're going back to work and they're not being given the tools or the safety guidelines or following safety guidelines to keep themselves safe because they do have to go back home to their child. Uh, a lot of our women live in multi-generational households. Mm -hmm. And so that is, you know, they're toggling that line between safety and financial security. Yeah. You know, when we were talking um, the other day, one of the things that you said really struck me as well, that, um, you know, that we've been talking about pregnancy discrimination or what happens when you're on the job, but that some of the mothers that you've, that you've worked with, they experience that before they even get the job, that, that's, uh, that, that their pregnancy becomes part of the kind of what works against them in the hiring process. Can you, can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, definitely. Uh, there is this fear of if I go into the workplace and they see that I'm pregnant, does that put me at a disadvantage for getting this job? This tone that I won't be um, looked at or considered because of my skills or my abilities or what I actually bring to the table, but versus the barriers that I bring because I might have maternity leave or I may have family responsibilities, things that men don't have to worry about when they go into right. the interviewing process. Right. Right. Uh, and younger women, a lot of these uh, women, this is their first job or their first, you know, real job is how they would explain it a lot of times. And there's, there's a fear around that. Am I going to be looked at because of, you know, because I'm a liability to this employer, yeah. uh, because of my responsibilities at home, and just empowering them with the information that, listen, you have something to offer. You deserve um, to work, especially if that's what you want to do. You deserve the right to have, have safety and have your children be safe um, and to be able to earn a living wage uh, so you can take care of yourself and, and your family. And so I think a lot of them are... Uh, they want as much information as they can get before they see um, the interviewer and go into the workplace so that they know in advance. You know, if they ask me this, is this okay? Uh, or are they allowed to ask me those right. questions? And uh, right. some of those answers are no, <laughs> they are right. not. Uh, but it's a matter of just knowing, you know, knowing what, what to expect and having the information that you need to be uh, to empower yourself in those moments. Right, right. So Rebecca, let's turn to you at this moment. Um, so you are, a, you know, you're a lawyer, you've specialized in pregnancy discrimination cases when things get so bad that you actually go, you know, into the legal system to try to get remedy and pregnancy discrimination, caregiver discrimination. What are you seeing now? Are there more cases being filed, you know, during coronavirus? How are workplaces responding? What are pregnant women sort of experiencing? And then let's move to like, what do we do about this? How do we fix this? But, but talk a little bit about kind of the legal landscape out there. Um, so thank you, Bridget, for having me on. I always love to have conversations with you and it's great to be with everybody who's uh, been, been talking so far. Um, it, at first, it, um, I told people when they were asking me it, like back in March, I said, wait, I said, it, it, just it, hang on, it's going to come. And it's sort of like- really wave. sad, that's sad. <laughs> I, well, and I knew this was going to happen because what I was hearing from people was this employer attitude that all bets are off because of COVID. Mm. Well, that would be wrong. Um, employees, and I said this at the time, I said, remember, employees still have rights, mm -hmm. whether it's the new law that was passed by Congress immediately or the laws that were already there, such as pregnant accommodation, you know, pregnant workers fairness acts. We, have, uh, with Dina's help, we passed one in Massachusetts, but these were all still in effect and coronavirus didn't wipe them out or wipe out obligations. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not how a lot of employers were acting. Um, in Massachusetts, we had a very high profile case of a nurse, uh, Dr. Deutsch probably has heard about it, um, in Springfield, who it appeared from the reporting, there wasn't even a conversation with her about accommodating her uh, or whether that was even possible. And the law in Massachusetts requires it. So there should have at least been an, um, a conversation with her about it, but that wasn't had. Mm. Uh, and this stems back to this idea that I think Gabrielle put it really well that pregnant workers are a burden on the workplace and this is their problem. They're a burden here and it's not our problem um, for what has to happen. You either choose to be pregnant or you choose to go home. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why we passed these laws. Um, 
so I, I would say that what we're seeing is, um, what's that expression, new wine and old skin or something like that. Um, <laughs> it's, um, it's the same, same old, same old. Pregnant workers are a burden and a lot of employers want to try to get rid of them as quickly as possible. Uh, mm -hmm. There was a report I read of a, um, of a case you told me about, Bridget, in California. Um, the worker announced that she was pregnant and same old playbook. Uh, they started giving her the worst jobs, the hardest jobs. She had to lift 50 pounds. And when people tried to help her, they were told they, they were ordered not to. Wow. Um, and, you know, she sought uh, accommodations because of coronavirus and they instead sent her to sanitize. So they put her in closer contact with the virus. Mm. Um, and then they fired her and said her performance was poor. Um, so, you know, it's, wow. um, that's, that's the same old playbook. <laughs> uh, there, there's not too much new about that. And, and I, I wanted to make one last comment. Um, it's something Shubu said, which was uh, the, about the impossible decisions. Yeah. And what we have to remember is that the general default rule in America is something called employment at will, which gives people very, very few rights, like really no rights at all. Hmm. The Pregnant Workers Fairness Acts are very important because they actually give you some rights and the Pregnancy Non-Discrimination Act gives you some rights. But the way the legal system works is that the employer can act and then the worker has to fight to get the rights back. Hmm. And where you have, in, especially with women in low wage jobs that don't have health insurance, that have no unions, um, there's, that's a really tough position to be in. Um, you know, telling a low wage worker, well, it's okay, you know, and that's okay, but you know, if they fire you, you have a lawsuit. Great. Um, that's not what she wants. What she wants is a job. She wants the right. money. She needs to pay her bills and, you know. So um, I think that's all, it's all important to think of all those things together because that's why these impossible decisions are being forced on pregnant workers. So at this point, let's turn back to you, Dr. Deutsch. So, so Ashley, so we've heard that so many women, particularly um, women in uh, lower wage positions, women without a lot of uh, power, um, really experience, uh, you know, some of these, uh, you know, it, unreasonable <laughs> experiences um, that really put them in, um, forcing, the, to, forcing them to make impossible choices with this notion that somehow a pregnant worker is a lesser worker or a less desirable worker, which as we all know, is not true. Um, so talk about your own experience, because it sounds like what, what you experienced, and, and granted, you are a skilled worker, you you know, you're in a, you know, you've got, uh, um, you know, perhaps skills that then, um, you know, in our, our workplaces are more rewarded than say for a low wage woman. Um, but it's a, it's sort of a bright spot and tell you know, what can we learn that, that other women can also benefit from uh, based on your experience? Sure. Well, yeah, I'd, I'd like to first acknowledge that my experience is very clearly the result of a couple of different privileges that I have. Um, I work for a healthcare organization, so they're uh, up to date and, lit and literate about public health, first of all. Um, I have a degree that allows some flexibility. There are many things that sort of work in my favor that other people don't necessarily have. Um, but for me, as an emergency physician, you know, I, I treat, I evaluate, come in contact with patients with infectious disease all the time. And that's, that's part of the job. And I did that all through my first pregnancy. Um, what's different with coronavirus is, is largely the unknown. We, especially when it started, did not know how it spread. We're still learning more about that. So it's hard to know how to protect yourself. It's hard to know if there's any risk to a pregnant woman or a fetus. And so it was really just a whole new aspect to my job. Mm. Um, and so as an organization, Bay State Medical Center, the HR department had sent out a... Um, an email saying if you you know if you're thinking about this your higher risk and requesting accommodations here's how you go about it they were quite proactive about that um, and so I sent something back saying I think at the time I was 24 weeks pregnant and I was requesting to not be in contact with patients who may have coronavirus right um, and which is they a very re reasonable thing to ask right <laughs> a very reasonable thing to ask well yes although i will say um that was granted to me they coordinated with infectious disease to make sure that these were reasonable requests they agreed mm -hmm. um, as an emergency physician it quickly became entirely impossible to avoid patients who may have coronavirus yeah and at that point the organization left it to my department for how best to utilize me in a different capacity and so for me, um, the department was wonderful in terms of 
um, allowing me to take on telehealth for patients who don't have primary care physicians. So we were serving a patient population that needed that, but I could do that from home um, for, for calling back test results, coronavirus test results, because we felt it was beneficial to our patients to speak with a physician at a time when information was really changing frequently. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and administratively to help with the policies and procedures within the entire hospital of how do we keep our, our patients and our staff safe. And that was mm -hmm. something I could also do from home and, ha and have been doing since, uh, since April. Um, I would say for the organization, they have sort of earned my undying gratitude over the way that they handled this and, and certainly lots of loyalty um, because both the department and Bay State Medical Center could have pushed back against these accommodations. And frankly, with all of my, even with all of my privilege, I would have had to go back to work clinically seeing patients. We, mm. we can't afford for me not to go to get paid during this yeah. time. So um, even in that position, I, I would have been forced to go back. Wow. So Dina, I see you nodding your head and I, and I've been hearing you sighing yeah. <laughs> throughout the, the, the podcast. Uh, you I know, should mute. <laughs> no, no, but, but it's, you know, this, these are issues that you hear about all the time. Yeah. And, you know, and one of the things that, um, you know, we were like, uh, Rebecca had mentioned the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, which is sort of enshrines in law that, that pregnant workers need and deserve reasonable accommodations to it in order to keep them working. That's only passed in 27 states. Um, you know, what, what do we do from here? Uh, what, yeah. are, what are we learning through COVID? What's becoming yeah. more and more apparent? How do we move right. forward? Well, look, how do we keep you we, from sighing? <laughs> well, I mean, because COVID has really laid bare these inequalities and these privileges. And, you know, I'm able to telecommute. And, but the women we hear from every day, you know, don't have employers like the one you just described and are really forced to make impossible choices. They are employers that are not following OSHA, that are not following the CDC. And they are forced to choose between earning a paycheck and maintaining their health. And it's just unacceptable. And, um, you know, that we live in a world where this is still a, an, a problem, you know, mm -hmm. and um, that we, you know, thankfully we now have 30 states, actually Tennessee um, oh, wow. most recently passed with, with um, you know, chamber support, which is a promising sign that even the U.S. chamber actually expressed support for the Federal Pregnant Worker Fairness Act. So this is an issue that, you know, if we want to keep the economy running, we need to ensure pregnant workers can stay healthy and on the job. And the Federal Pregnant Worker Fairness Act would create a uniform law to ensure that pregnant workers can get the immediate accommodations they need to stay healthy and on the job. I totally agree with Rebecca. I mean, the women who call our helpline, they're not calling necessarily to sue their employer. They're scared out of their minds and they want to say, what do I need to know and how do I keep my job? And so that's the framework, what this law would put in a place, a clear framework to help put women do just that. Yeah. So um, we need, you know, as we think about the recovery and we think about what needs to be put in place along with other measures like paid family and medical leave and quality affordable child care, we need the Federal Pregnant Worker Fairness Act. You know, Gabrielle, let me, let me turn to you kind of as you've been listening to the conversation, you think about the, the young mothers that you're helping. What do you see? Where, what do we need to learn? What do we need to be doing? Um, you know, I just remember, uh, you know, again, working with Rebecca and, and Dina over the years, covering a Supreme Court case where a UPS worker who was pregnant and was not supposed to lift heavy stuff and all she wanted to do was sort of deliver letters and she was not allowed. And that went all the way to the Supreme Court. And that just seems so ridiculous and a waste of time and let her deliver letters and then let her go back to work after she gives birth. You know, what do you see um, that we need to do kind of moving forward? How do we make this better for the moms that you work with? Yeah, moving forward, um, and we work with women just like that, but someone saw her, someone gave her the information, they partnered with her to push this to the Supreme Court. She had to have a, a lot of allies in that process. And so what I would say is be someone who can amplify a voice of someone who was unseen and unheard in these circumstances and use the power and privilege that you may have in whatever position that is to 
move this forward and to make this more seen. And so the, the fact that this was such an underlying issue for so long and COVID had to bring it out is in itself problematic. Mm -hmm. So any way that you can bring these things to the forefront, continue to educate, continue to just amplify the voices uh, that are so long silenced uh, is, is where I would say we need to focus our efforts. Yeah, so Kushbu, as you're thinking about you know, uh, coverage moving forward. Um, you know, I, what are you thinking about in, in terms of, of uh, what you'll continue to be, to, to be watching and looking at when it comes to pregnant workers, pregnant women, new mothers? Well, well Gabrielle just hit it on the head, you know, and I think um, Dina um, has highlighted this. We're, we're going to continue looking at systemic inequalities, right, that sort of feed into um, the inequity in maternal health care in the U.S. And so, now we're looking at the next step of all the stories that we um, have talked about in this program and our reporters are looking at how childcare deserts, these new childcare deserts nationwide are affecting working mothers, mm -hmm. how this potential end to $600, these weekly benefits will, will affect unemployed mothers and what this ever changing pandemic, as you know, everyone has said, we just don't know what's happening um, as Dr. Deutsch said earlier um, and what this landscape will mean for mothers and pregnant women alike as we begin to unearth, you know, what the impact will be on women, right, as they go through their pregnancies, as they, they go into labor, when they come home. And so um, we're just looking at it from all angles. Unfortunately, um, we just, it's everything is, it's such a big unknown. Mm -hmm. So Re Rebecca, Closing thoughts. Uh, I know we could we could all talk about this for ages, and we all want to, you know, to 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 make this better. How do we put you out of business? <laughs> How do we make it so that lawyers like you do not need to be taking up cases for pregnancy discrimination? It, my view has always been that workers need more rights in general. I mean, to echo what Gabrielle and Shubu were saying, and and what Dina was saying about the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act. Workers don't have a lot of rights in this country. And when you don't have a lot of rights, that means you're not valued as a human. Mm. Um, and you're not valued, you're a cog in a wheel. You're, you know, these workers are being treated like they're a thing on a shelf instead of a human. Um, and I've always, I've come to the conclusion after 22 years of doing this, that when people don't have rights in the workplace, they aren't valued as human beings. Mm. And that makes all of the systemic prejudices we have, the racism, the sexism, it makes it worse. And I think workers in this country need more rights in general. And I think the whole idea of business prerogative, you know, be taking um, precedence over everything else is wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we as a nation have to stop thinking that way. Uh, we can look at comparators in other parts of the world that are doing very well, that have good economies, that don't run theirs the way we run ours. It's not necessary. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if anything's been laid bare by this pandemic, it's what happens when you don't give working people rights. And when you don't recognize that having a job and the need for income and the need for economic security should be a basic human right. Mm -hmm. Well, on that very powerful note, thank you all. Thank you so much to the to all the panelists for, for coming on, for sharing your stories and your experience and wisdom. Uh, I wanna thank all the participants who have been active on the chat. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of the questions that were raised. Um, thank you all to, for joining us. Thanks to the New America Events team, Better Life Lab team, my producer, David Schulman. Um, thank you all. Um, next week, we're gonna be talking a deep dive yet again into childcare because this is an ongoing burning house crisis and really looking at what's it going to take to move the United States from where we are to, to something that, that works for all people, all families. Um, how do we get to that universal high quality system? What's it going to take? In the meantime, stay safe, wash your hands, wear your mask, and we'll see you next week.